Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Voice of Bold Business Radio. I am your host, Jessica Duell of Red Direction. This is program 16, Leveraged Lessons. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about, well, obviously, leveraged lessons. But what does that mean and how do we use them? And, you know, every day that goes by that we're learning something new, the hard things or the easy things, are we actually putting it in luggage and carrying it along behind us so our wagon turns into something that needs to attach to the back of a vehicle and that vehicle becomes a trailer tractor and then it becomes who knows what kind of storage facility just taking up stuff that's always in our consciousness. Do we need all of it or do we only need some of it? And really, we're going to discuss that and so much more. Before I begin though with the conversation that we're going to have today with Joel Dawson, I want to read a fable called Belling the Cat. Long ago, the mice had a general council to consider what measures they could take to outwit their common enemy, the cat. Some said this, and some said that, but at last a young mouse got up and said he had a proposal to make, which he thought would meet the case. You will all agree, he said, that our chief danger consists in the sly and treacherous manner in which the enemy approaches us. Now, we could receive some signal of her approach. We could escape from her. I venture, therefore, to propose a small bell be procured, attached by a ribbon, and put it around the neck of the cat. By this means, we should always know when she was about, and we could easily retire while she was in the neighborhood. The proposal was met with general applause until an old mouse got up and said, that's all very well, but who is to bell the cat. The mice looked at one another and nobody spoke. And then the own old mouse said, it is easy to propose impossible remedies. Now, why I chose this one about putting a bell around a cat's neck is because it's also about execution. So not only might we be talking about baggage today, we also might be talking about execution and how we learn from the ideas and do we actually make and take certain steps forward. So on this Leaders Discuss program, you will find out. Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business, the show that provides everything smart leaders need to evaluate situations, build relationships, and create solutions. Jessica Duo candidly talks about the skills necessary to build tenacity and do more with less. And now, here's Jessica. Joel Dawson, welcome to our Leaders Discuss panel today. Hello, hello, and how are you? Doing very well. You know, you've been on a few shows, and I know you're posted on our website, and there's a lot of information that people can find out about you. But I want to spend just a minute and talk about uh, you for a minute, because I want people to understand why I have you come on and do these Leader Discuss panels with me. So in your own words, what would you say about why you are here? Because I'm probably the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> she, calls, she calls everybody. It's like, well, you got no, 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 no. Well, who's left? You go to the back of the page. Well, there's Joel. We can call him. And let's see. So that, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I hope that's not it. Ladies and gentlemen, because you want to know something, Joel and I met. Okay, I have to tell this little bit of a backstory today. Joel and I met. I don't even remember how we met, but we came across each other's radar and we decided we were going to have this video call. And so here we are having this video call and turns out he's a really cool stinking guy. He is stinking cool. That's a better way to say it. And not, so, not speaking metaphorically, not definitely metaphorically. That's right. No, notice we've never been in person. So I could not attest one way or the other. <laughs> but so what we ended up, we were talking about a couple of things and it turns out, he has been doing some coaching and training in verbal and nonverbal communication and how we actually show up and present ourselves. And once I found out that this is what he does, I was like, we need to talk about this more. And at the time, Scott Scowcroft and I, we had the first iteration of, my, of, of our show, which was called The Jess and Scott Show. So that preceded what I'm doing now with the Voice of Bold Business Radio. But, you know, Joelle came on, and we had such a fabulous conversation that we've stayed in touch ever since. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm really not stinky. <laughs> 
I think it's funny. We, 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 we really are friends. And I hope I'm not at the bottom of the list. As she said, we've never met before. So I don't know if I'm at the top, the bottom, the back page or. Okay. We had never met before, like what, two years ago. So this I is know, very right? different today. Okay. We, let's put some more context around that. All right. <laughs> 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 well, and we've been staying in touch. You've been telling me about what you've been doing lately, and I keep you abreast yeah. of what's going on in the world of Red Direction. So tell us, what are you doing these days so that everybody who's listening knows the type of leader that you are and the impact that you're making? Well, you know, um, as, as I said early on, on an early episode, I think it was maybe six or seven that you had me on. I just returned from D.C. at the 2016 World Championship of Public Speaking, and, you know, since then, I've taken on a lot of clients where, you know, I actually help them with their sales presentation, whether it be for their company, whether it be for startups that are, you know, are going to be pitching to investors or what have you. But my background is in sales and I have a lot of online courses as well as do consulting with companies to help them through the sales process because a lot of people have lumped sales and marketing together. And it's actually two different things. It's like cat and mice. <laughs> it's, nice it's, it's time. You can't lump them two together. You don't have them two together as pets. It doesn't work. Right. That's exactly right. Well, and you know, um, everybody who's been listening to the show knows how spot on that Joel is with his sales background and how he brings this element, which by the way, I think most people are lumping this together because especially when they're smaller, they are trying to cover up the fact that sales are necessary by doing this thing called marketing or in, and it turns out that the marketing is done instead of sales. And that is the quickest way to no growth, zero growth and negative growth and destroy companies. Exactly. You know, when I first sit down with a company in their diagnosis, I explained to them normally, and this is how if I can help them out. Normally a business falls into three scenarios. Either there's, Low activity, low production, high activity, low production, high activity, and high production. What I do, regardless of which one of those scenarios we're in, we start to develop a culture where you have low activity and high production. But to go back to what you were saying, Jessica, when, when someone just does marketing, okay, well, let's skip the no production, no activity, because we know what that means. You're not doing anything. Right. Okay. So we have to take a look at what, you know, what's called that, what's actually holding you back from that. Okay. But let's take a look at the high activity, low production. Normally that's a marketing issue, or I should say a conversion issue because they're, they're doing a lot of different things. They're doing a lot of different things, but converting that to actual sales, it, it, it's just not happening. Or they're spending a lot of money and there's like, it's like a faucet. You're only getting a little drip out. So what they do is they'll spend more money to get a bigger drip. Well, if you just really focus on the sales process without spending more money and really learning how to sell for the same amount of money that you use for marketing, you can actually increase your productivity by just focusing on your whole sales process. I love it. And you know, you said something key in there. Um, I did. You did. Actually, you said a lot of key things, but the what stuck out to me that I really want our listeners to take away is you're spending money on marketing and that marketing is great. It's doing something for you because you're continuing to spend money on that. So what if we got better at answering people's questions before they started talking to us? What if we got better spent figuring out what are their pain points and being able to position our product accordingly? What if all of those things were done so that so that a person, somebody on the team, us, whomever, the leader that is going to take this initiative can go out and start having conversations and actually do market testing with dialogue between people. Uh, yes, it's in terms of time is money. It is money. Yet no more investment of money has to be made. You're actually figuring things out with the investment of time, with the investment of thoughtfulness. And that pays way bigger dividends than trying to lump it all in and hope marketing gets it all right. Right, because what they're doing is, and this is the, the, one of the biggest tendencies that I see. First of all, it's an assumption that if I market to you, you're automatically a, a prospect. And that's not the case. So the high activity in the low production, 
the high activity is the marketing doing a lot and they're just giving their presentation and not knowing if they actually have, as you said, that pain point. They, they, they don't know, but they, they're counting that as you know, a prospect and it should be a prospect. In order for somebody to be a prospect in any sales cycle, and one thing I always tell people, I can sell anything from toilet paper to atomic bombs, okay? The process is the same. It's the same. In order for that person to be a prospect of yours, two things that you have to have from them. They have to have a want or need for your product or service. They ha well, that's key. <laughs> Not just because you have the email address. Right, that's right. They have to have a want or need for your service. Mm -hmm. Number two, they have to have the ability to pay. Yep. Okay. Now, I, I, I say that because a lot of times, you know, people get caught up in so many different things where they say, well, and if I'll ask them about when we start talking about the numbers, they give me a whole, start giving me paragraphs about this. I don't need paragraphs. All mm -hmm. I need are the numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all I need are the numbers. And as I say, sales is very predictable. It's like being pregnant. Either you are or you ain't. Plain and simple. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just like that. Mm -hmm. so, and when I look at them, I ask, okay, well, this person did not have a want or a need. Or sometimes it's like, well, you know, yeah, this person really loves it. They want it. Well, you know, they got, I said, well, what's about the money? Do they have the money? Well, they want a discount and you know, all this other stuff comes up. But you have to, it, it kind of like what I call sitting like an eagle, watching everything from above. That means that if they didn't have the money, they are not a prospect. Plain and simple, they are not a prospect. So our question is, what is a, an experience or a situation that we encounter that we learned a lesson from, and what part of that lesson do we use today? The immediate thing that pops into my head, Jessica, was, you know, you, you, you know my story. Mm -hmm. You know, just, it, it seems like a long time ago, but it really wasn't. You know, just five years ago, me being homeless mm -hmm. and, you know, being on the street, for almost two years, that, you know, that, that was the lowest of the low, so to speak. Because trust me, that is not a career choice. Right. When things start to happen, and, you, and, and I found myself at that point, not at that point, the low point, I'm talking about when I'm standing, you know, on the bridge, you know, getting ready to jump off. You know, it, for some reason, I had that, that, that moment of clarity. And the decisions that I made, because I didn't want to go back to that. And I, I decided I wasn't going to go back to that life ever again. I decided to, to start a new life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now here's, the, here's the thing about that. You don't always got to give some kind of background, but you know, this is why we do certain things that we do, how certain people can just, you know, us up just like that can flip a switch and all of a sudden they're off to the races. Mm -hmm. okay. One of the first things that, that that caused me to do was to get extremely focused, extremely focused on what the rest of my life was going to look like. Because remember, you know, when you know, I'm, I'm standing up there and, and, you know, a voice just as clear as day says, what's it going to be, Joel? Do you want to live or do you want to die? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I thought and I said, you know, I want to live but I don't want to go back to that old life. Mm -hmm. So I made some, some decisions while I was standing there on that bridge. And you can read all about it in my book if you like. But one of the things that I decided that I was going to do on that bridge, didn't have a home, didn't have any money, was that I was going to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I got extremely focused on that because of the emotional state that I was in. This is why some people can just, you know, say, well, you know, I'm going to do this and they just do it versus people say, well, yeah, you know, you don't understand. I got this. I got that. I was extremely focused mm -hmm. on the task at hand. And that was because of the emotional state that I was in at that point. So it, it was a couple of things that I was able to take away from that experience that really made me the person that I am today. Mm -hmm. The second thing that it did, other than being ex extremely focused, was I didn't need anyone's approval. Mm -hmm. Now, what I mean is, a lot of times, this is, this is what happens. Have you ever heard of Maslow's Law 
or is high hierarchy, hierarchy of, needs. of needs yes right okay i'm a firm believer that that's why we make some of the decisions that we do okay whether it be in your personal life or business this is why we make some of the things that why do we make the decisions that we do make now knowing that your physiological needs your security needs your love and belonging needs and all your, your self actual your 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 self esteem needs that comes from your center of influence the people that give you that that's your family your friends any anybody that you know that you communicate with on a regular basis so what happens we're talking business now somebody decides that they're going to start a business or they want to venture out and do this or maybe change their business they say well you know hey mom hey dad Let's sit down. I want to have a talk with you. Or they sit down with their spouse or they sit down with, with someone else and they say, well, I'm thinking about starting a business or they say, well, I'm thinking about taking my business this way. Okay. And what happens is if that person doesn't think it's a good idea, of course, they're going to tell you that's what you want. You want them to tell you, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. Huh. Wrong. Big mistake because yeah. you're really not asking for advice. What you're yeah. asking for is approval. You want to be accepted. You think you're asking for advice, but you're not. You're asking for approval. Because if I wanted to start a business, let's say if I wanted to start a bakery, I wouldn't ask my dad who's a welder. That doesn't right. make good business sense. Right. right? That's or, true. Yeah. What's that? I said that's true. Yeah. Right. Or if someone's a school teacher and, you know, I want to be, you know, whatever. If, if they're not in that field, you have to understand yourself that you're really not asking for advice what you're doing is you're act, acting for acceptance mm -hmm. you're really asking for acceptance so the, the the second thing that i was able to take away from that experience was that i didn't need acceptance or approval from anybody because first of all my friends were gone <laughs> they left right. it, it, was, it was just me mm -hmm. but i realized that i wasn't going to ask them or say i just started doing it i just i just started because i didn't need anybody's approval i remember watching this I don't remember what movie it was, but it was one of these old mafia movies. And of course they catch the guy, you know, of course they always owe money. I don't know why people borrow money from the mafia and never pay them back. You know, that's how you wind up with cement shoes on it and fish and all this kind of stuff. Uh -huh. they catch this guy. They lay him on a table and they strap him down. This, it's gotta be in New York somewhere because the guy has this tin bucket. And in this bucket, he has this humongous rat. So he pulls out this rat by the tail, and the rat's like this big, minus the tail, it's a huge rat. The rat's just like squealing, okay? Of course, this guy starts screaming. They rip his shirt open, they lay the rat on his chest, and they hurry up and they put the tin bucket on it, on top of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, the guy is screaming. So the guy starts telling him about the rat, and this is certain things that I didn't know. He said a rat can actually eat his way through a galvanized pipe, a steel pipe. Steel pipe, uh-huh. Okay, so he takes a torch and he starts heating the tin bucket. Mm -hmm. Of course, now he's, he, the, the rat's like, wee, wee, just screaming, screaming his head off. And so the guy was like, help, take it off, take it off, take it off. And then the guy says, he says, as long as that rat is screaming, you have nothing to worry about. If that rat is silent, that rat is about to take action and he's about to get out of that bucket, which means he's gonna start eating through the softest part, which would be him. Mm -hmm. And I said all of that to say that a lot of times people, you know, they say they wanna do this or they say they're gonna do that. You know, it's just like the rat in the bucket, nothing's gonna happen. Right. When you didn't make that decision that you're gonna do something, you just start doing it. You do not need any type of, any type of approval from anyone. You just start doing it. Okay. Yes, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. It was one more one more thing that I did get out of that mm -hmm. was because I had made that decision that that's what I was going to do. And I knew that I had a long way to go because remember, I started my business in a crack hotel. I did on the bed of that crack hotel and I expanded it to 17 parishes across the state of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I got an insane work ethic insane i that's the only that was my only focus mm -hmm. i wake up in the morning and i go to bed at night with just my business on my mind there was never any breaks at all 
and, and I'll tell you how insane it was. <laughs> I went from that hotel to my daughter's couch. Mm-hmm. From my daughter's couch to an apartment. And in that apartment, I would work from day in to day out. Day in to day out. The last month I stayed in that apartment, I made $21,000. The only thing I had in that apartment was an air mattress, a coffee pot, and a microwave. And I was still eating ramen noodles every day. Mm-hmm. That's how focused I was on being successful. So the it, it was almost like a like a blessing in disguise for me because I wouldn't have nothing. Well, I can't say nothing, but the things that I have in Georgia today, I would not have that mm-hmm. if I hadn't went through that experience because these are the things that hold a lot of people back from starting their business or actually getting to that next level. The focus, the work ethic, and the, the, the feeling that they need approval from someone. They always figure that they have, have to have everything right. I have to know this. I have to know that. I have to know this person. You don't have to do it. You just have to get started. Uh, you are woo, woo, woo. that's all I gotta say oh, woo, woo. <laughs> woo, woo. raise that roof because that's interesting I was I, I had picked out two stories for this and they're nothing like your story so first of all I want to say thank you for sharing it thank you for talking about it thank you for sharing some of those details because a lot of us do face things that we either choose to forget or we choose to ignore or we choose not to learn from like you did. And having that as a model is pretty amazing. Which, by the way, listening to his story, hearing him speak on all of the shows so far that, that Joelle has been involved in, now you know why I called him up to be on the show as a panelist on a regular basis because he has a but good it wasn't because I was the last one. strong voice. No, my friend, there are a lot of people that didn't even make the list. <laughs> Yeah, I got to say, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, so I was thinking about some things because I was like, okay, now that I've heard your story, I'm going to share a story about a conflict of values that really helped me be who I am today. And it helps me overcome other obstacles that make problems and things that I have to face a little bit easier to do so. So they don't seem as hard as this particular story I'm going to tell. When my first company was bought, I was 21 years old, and um, my husband and I, we both were part of this company that we was acquired. I started traveling, and I traveled a lot, and they decided that they really wanted us in Minnesota instead of in Washington State. And Ryan was like, yeah, hell no, we're not moving. And I was like, but what about my career? I have this ability to be to move up in this organization. This is something that I really want. And at the time, this is what I really wanted. I wanted to move up the ladder. I wanted to make a bigger impact. I wanted to be part of the senior team of this organization even more than I was through the acquisition, right? I wanted to become part of that. I wanted to learn from it. And so I really struggled because I put everything and all of my energy when I'm at work into work. Just like when I'm at home, I put all of my energy into being at home and in my family. Now, that's the outcome of this story because at the time it wasn't. This business was who I was. I associated my identity with it. And when Ryan and I came to this impasse, I really had to sit down and say, what is important? Is moving to Minnesota to be able to become Um, more involved at a more even more strategically than I was even more in more of a leadership and involved in more of the organization than I was being in in Washington State and I had to weigh that against this man that I'm totally in love with which by the way that was back then I'm still totally in love with this dude today (laughs) Ryan and um, you know and could we live apart and what did that mean for the investment in my family and the life that I wanted to create with Ryan that we had already started to create together. And so I really had to sit down and go, well, what are my values? And I was like, oh, well, the world is my oyster and, and all, anything I want I can have. And it turned out I couldn't have everything I wanted at the same time. And I sat down and I really thought about it. And It was the hardest thing. It was the hardest thing I ever did. It was over tears and it was over a little bit of alienation because 
I was the only one that could make the decision. I was looking for approval. I was looking for acceptance, no matter what my decision was going to be. And it came down to the fact that after all of these emotions and feeling like I had to give up something that I had worked so hard to achieve, give up something that was just being handed to me, it turned out, I said, no, I said, no, I'm not going to move to Minnesota. Ryan and I are not moving to Minnesota. We are going to stay in Washington state and we're going to figure out how to make this work this way. And what I found out was they didn't think I was going to move anyway, but they put it on the table to just see what I was going to do. And, <laughs> but you know, they offered it to me knowing they had a place for me and they wanted me to do this, but they also offered it knowing it was very unlikely that I would do this smart boss. I mean, realistically, the president of the company, super smart. Mm -hmm. Well, let, so, me, let me ask you this before yeah. you, because yeah, yeah. I, because I have a similar situation that okay. did happen. Yeah. Did you ever have any resentment? Well, and this is where I was going to go. So here's what I did. I made this decision and I made this decision for what I wanted. And for a while, I felt like I was held back and that had to go someplace. And I sure I was, I wasn't going to take ownership and responsibility for my decision. Are you kidding me? It's not my fault. I had to stay in Washington state. You're a wonder woman. Of course. Of course. I, <laughs> exactly. Right. It's not my fault. Well, what I, and that was actually one of the biggest lessons that I learned was that once I actually was able to grasp the fact that, you know, it is my fault. It's my fault. I wanted both things and it's my fault that I had to choose. And it's my fault that the timing wasn't right, that they couldn't happen at the same time. But you know, I was also very much in the moment. I was not thinking ahead. I was not, um, I was not really calculating much more than this moment where I thought I was having everything I had. So it's kind of like the bell, the cat story in that sense of, well, I have all of these ideas, but what's actually going to make these ideas happen. And it, until I made the decision, you know, until I made the decision to stay, I had to work through some emotions around that. Yeah. And there was resentment. Um, and right. And it was, un, it was unfair. I mean, it was unfair of me to do that, but at the same point in time, as I was working through that and as I was going through the motions, I actually became stronger and more settled. There was like this calm knowing, like you said, like when you were describing the rat story, that was why I was like, Oh, this is the story I'm going to tell. Because once I got through, even when I made the decision before the resentment kind of kicked in, um, I, I knew, I knew it was the right decision. And I knew it was the right choice. And then my brain just had to rationalize it because here I was, am I going to choose my family or am I going to choose my work? And that's really what it came down to. And the answer is I decided to choose both. And in choosing both, I gave up something that I thought I really wanted. That was this level of achievement that I never thought I was, that I never thought I was able to, going to be able to get. And then it was just handed to me. And then I actually working through the resentment learned through myself that it was actually the best thing to do and I'm stronger than I thought I was and I can have both. And the fact that this was just handed to me, I knew there was something even bigger and stronger waiting for me because I decided what my values were and I made a decision in accordance to them. And really I owned that. So the resentment was ill placed anyway, because I should have only been looking at myself back then. I should have only been looking at me if I had any issues of, of that instead of outward to whomever it happened to be reflected and then actually deflected to right right but awesome. that calm that calm knowing was a pretty big important thing but it comes down to my values was okay there's this thing and there's this, things are in conflict and when you get right down to it once the values are known it's very easy to put a filter to any decision and it may not seem fair but there's, it's still a fairly clear outcome when you stick to that. And um, what, so coming out of that, looking at today, now that Ryan and I have, I mean, this was like, holy cow. We were married. We were probably married for four years when this, no, two, maybe two, two or three years when this was all going down. Um, and that was 17 years ago. And so looking at that, now we have a family. We have a five-year-old. And so one day he and I sat down and I said, Ryan, you know, we do a really good job of living our values that I see. We're, con we're content 
We are striving to be the best that we can be. We are taking action to make impact in our own way, both in our lifestyle and in our communities, so in our world. But what does that actually look like? How do we, how do we teach, and this of course was a few years ago, how do we teach this to this little person that we want to show up and to have a sense of value and values that we liked from our parents that they gave to us, from our experiences as a couple, and now for our family in this place in this time. And it took a while, and we came up with three that our family and our house lived by, and all of ours, um, and every all of Ryan's and all of mine roll up into these. So we've adopted them as our household values, which are awareness, responsibility, and honesty. So what, everything else for us rolls up to those three. So when we're talking about integrity, when we're talking about wisdom, when we're talking about strength and focus and attention, all of those fit into awareness, responsibility, and honesty. Even in Red Direction's values, the values of the company that I have created, my latest company that I'm working with and creating and having success with, rolls up into those as well. So everything that I do is, is in alignment, which is very cool in the sense that when I'm posed with a business partnership, when I'm posed with a very important decision or maybe maybe even a seemingly insignificant decision, I can still put it through my values and find out if it sticks or not. And to me, that's what came out of this whole thing of do I move, do I not move, was what are my values and how do I use those to actually live my life and be okay? And yes, I went through resentment. I went through anger. I went through sadness. I went through, I actually went through loss. I actually thought I was a losing part of myself with the decision that I made um, because it was yeah. so tied to my identity. Mm -hmm. My success in business was so tied to my identity that I had no concept of what it was going to be if I wasn't this thing. Um, and it turned out we I was talked, pretty cool. We talked about that. Um... I'm trying to think of what episode it was. We were talking about busy, yeah. being busy, and we mm -hmm. talked about how a lot of people, you know, that their 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 success or and their identity is tied to their job. Yes, it, it, yes. it really is. Yeah, it is, and we do things because we think we need to do them. So, and yeah, so the leverage lesson for you, if I were to repeat it back to you in the story your story that you shared is that you had a choice to go forward or not and the experiences that you had you used as a platform to launch from yes and then my story if i were to sum it up was i had to really figure out what's what i really wanted and how i showed up to things without making things my identity and that became the launching pad for how things were moving forward that I that I launched from. Right. In that, you know, we were talking about not going back. I mean, there's this thing. So have you ever had an experience where the same thing keeps popping up and you're like, why am I having to deal with this again? Why am I having to deal with this again? Have you ever had one of those? I, I used to have you used to. Okay. And when I say I used to have them it's because you know, my, my situation is, is, is different from yours in the sense to there's a lot of things that I had to change mm -hmm. about my center of influence because when, when, when you're in that, a, a certain center of influence, you think a certain way, and because you think a certain way, it brings about certain actions. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I removed myself mm -hmm. from that physically as well as mentally. And started making. I had. A, I had. A, I started creating a desired center of influence for myself personally, and that's you know just recreating who I was. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, you know, a lot of the the actions or the things that I used to deal with, I no longer had to deal with because I was no longer in that environment. Now, the, on on a sh short term, I've been back to that location physically. And just in talking to certain people, I find myself getting back into that mindset. I'm like, why are we talking about this? Why? And then I realize, okay, because now you put yourself back in that, in that influence. That's why 
these things are being fed to you. That's why you're having these thoughts. That's why you're saying, why am I dealing with this again? Because you put yourself there. Old habits do die hard. And you're yeah. right. Sometimes you have to get out and get away. And sometimes you can't go back. And that's where, you know, the old habits piece is very interesting because when new situations, now let's, so new situations that crop up, it doesn't matter if it's at home, it doesn't matter if it's at work, it doesn't matter if it's out in the world. When there's a certain kind of stress, the, the habits that sometimes we have worked the most, the hardest on, or habits we didn't even know we had, we're drawing from our past experience and what was modeled to us. And that could be from, um, that could be from it bosses, that could be from mentors, that could be from family, that could be from parents. It could even be, you know, from the neighbors. It doesn't even matter today or 25 or 30 or whenever our childhood was. So those old habits, and sometimes we don't even know we have a habit. We rely on what was modeled for us in situations of unknown. And when I hear you say you changed your center of influence, you intentionally did that, do you find yourself in high stress or unexpected stressful situations going beyond before that to your previous center of influence, even though you're physically not there? Well, I don't, I don't have a high stress. I'm not in a high stress profession. I'm not. And I normally handle those well, but if there's one thing that I can't, I, sometimes I swear a lot. And it's just, you, and it's, you are a sailor in disguise. Marie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the funniest thing is, sometimes, you know, I'm like, well, you know, I, I don't do that anymore. But it feels so good if I can just close the door and just let one just rip out and just, mm -hmm. just go on a rant for about five minutes and then I can go. <laughs> right. You know, that's a transformation of energy. Um, there are times we actually play growling games in our house when I can tell if you and everybody listening here's kind of an interesting tip if you are catching yourself holding your breath and you're really not breathing and you keep not breathing and then when you breathe out you're breathing through your nose kind of like a snort of a bull if you're even if it's very soft if you catch yourself going with intention where you're like using your whole diaphragm to breathe even if it's not super loud it's time to get in a closet like Joel, or shut the door in a room and, and let it out. If it's profanity, awesome. We growl in our house if it's growling. And sometimes I'm like, I gotta go for a walk. Ryan, he goes for a run. He's like, I'm out of here. Uh, we'll keep talking about this later. He'll go for a run. But it's that, that's a transformation of energy. It's there. It's ready to come out because something's gotta change. So it sounds like there's you're, you're actually in tune with your body and your body doesn't need to rely on anything old before anything okay. and I'm this way too well I don't know if you're okay <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying I'm, I'm noticing and I've got the same thing as I'm in tune with myself enough to go oh I don't have to old habits can come up and sometimes I open my mouth and I'm like wow did I just say that in a business meeting I really just sounded like my great-grandpa right then <laughs> and I'm like oh he's been you know he he has not been around for a while. And I was like, that just came out of my mouth. How funny is that? So it's interesting where things will come out because they're second nature to us. But if we are able to use that and launch from them, we don't actually have to bring them along with them. We can let them go. And then we're told physically in our bodies that something is up and we can decide to transform it or not. And if we hold on to it, who knows how it's going to come out. I mean, dude, yeah. I actually, I actually can be a serious, um, a force of nature, and that can be a good thing, and that can be a really bad thing, just like in Mother Nature. <laughs> well, let me let me ask you this, and, yeah. and I'm, now I'm really curious. Okay. You said that when you yeah when you growl, so to speak, yeah. your husband says, "I'm out here." Is he? Oh, those are two. Oh, I'm sorry. Those were two different things. Does he know what's about to happen? Is he running away? Oh, well, yes, and I actually get to the point where I'm like, "I'm out of here," and I'll go into the closet, and I will be. I'm like, guys. I'm out. So I was actually using my way of transforming that energy is to go into a closet, get it to the point where I can just growl it right out. And when Ryan gets to that point where he's got this, he just is like, I'm out. I'm going to go run. 
Oh, so he's not running for his life. No, he's not running for his life, but maybe he should. I mean, it would be like <laughs> Danny Knowles um, tells this, uh, Dr. Daniel Knowles, he's my chiropractor. In some of his presentations, he tells the story of, would you rather, um, would you rather hear a lion's roar or would you rather smell its breath first? <laughs> Right, and, and so when when you were saying that, I was like, well, maybe he's hearing the lion roar, and he knows he's got to get away. I don't know, or maybe he realizes he's gonna try because he smells the breath a little too late. Yeah, <laughs> it gets, a little too close. A little too close, right? Um, but I think it's interesting about this intentional action. So, do you have a, like one tip for being intentional about action for making a change? You you said you intentionally changed your center of influence. And I intentionally decided to align my actions to my values. Both of our stories have that in common, the intentional action. Do you have a tip how to be intentional in, our, in your actions or for us? The, the one thing that I would say is this. First of all, don't, don't ask for approval. Understand what you're doing. You're, you're not asking for advice. Yeah. And just, just, just make a decision. And this is why, I t this is why, I t whether it be personal or whether it be in business, this is the way people make decisions. A lot of the times, and and, and this really focuses on personal, but business as well. If they have an inkling mm -hmm. that okay, there is a decision that they have to make. A lot of times, they have a gut feeling as to what what side of the fence they want to be on. So what they're going to do is they're going to ask people that are already on that side. Mm -hmm. to get approval. Okay. If it, I give you, I give you an example, let's talk relationships. Yep. Okay. I'm saying I have a lot of friends that are married or just dating and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they decide to break up, if they decide to stay together, they're going to ask people or confiding people that want them to stay together. Mm -hmm. If they want to leave that person, they're not going to talk to people that want them to stay together. They're going to talk to people that's going to reinforce the decision that they've already made. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is this. Look at, just like you said, look at your values. What do I want? What's going to, what's going to make me whole again mm -hmm. after all of this? What do I need to do? You make that decision on your own. That's right. On your own with no influence from anyone. And whatever decision that you make, stick with it, and you reinforce that with action. Yep. My tip would be similar in the sense that um, you use what you know. So in my case, I decided my values are what I know, and in any situation, those values will carry me through. And so even if it doesn't feel right, even if it feels really wrong, when you look at it from the lens of the values, when you look at it from what you know, you will always be in a good place because you're staying with in integrity. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I don't see your big cup today. You know what? It's because I'm it's because I'm in a different location. So my mate happens to be in the biggest cup I can get from Whole Foods, ah, Allegro's okay. coffee bar, which I don't buy coffee there, but I get my mate tea. Okay. And I have a gigantic cup of water here, but it's, you know, my big orange cup. What? Like Swiss cheese. I know, isn't that cool? It's a glass bottle. So we're really big into, well, not really reusable and sustainable cup, but reusable and sustainable water bottles. So we try and be reusable and sustainable as much as possible. We also don't like plastic in our house for a variety of reasons. And so we've decided to go with glass. Well, your glass jar, your glass containers kind of need a protector because they still get dropped once in a while or banged once in a while or you know, whatever. And so the plastic on the outside, it does. It looks like Swiss cheese. But yep. it's sustainable. It's like a giant baby bottle. They make baby versions of this. <laughs> Get out. I'm not. No, they make them little. Carter used to have little glass ones. As soon really? as, as soon as he was big enough to hold them, we had we had glass little glass ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> they make wow. they make wine glasses so you can like take them camping or go out around a campfire and have something a little sustainable if you're like us and you don't like plastic and that kind of thing. Isn't that funny? Gotcha. Um, so we are almost out of time and we're not going to be able to dive into all of the things that I, that came out of the answers that Joelle and I shared today. We came back to the intentional action, which covers 
the concept of making a decision it also covers the concept of values and um, let's see what were It also covers not going, well, let's quickly talk about going back or not going back. If all of us, ha all of us have an experience where we've learned this lesson and we can choose to do something with it, we can choose to do nothing, uh, and there's probably another one. But if we choose to do something, we choose not to. Let's take each end of the spectrum there. If we do nothing, we can recognize it was a problem, and maybe we'll think we'll never have that again, so it's not worth looking back. Will it ever come up? Is it something that we think about when we are, you know, I'm trying to think, what is the, do we ever feel regret about it? Or do we ever wish we might have done something different? It's kind of like, and those are more heat of the moment things, I think, than big life decisions or big life changing decisions. Like, uh, did we speak out of anger? And I know that haunts me. If I say something to somebody and it's mean and I'm doing it because I'm mad, that will come up later and I will feel sorrow about that. And I will feel, um, I feel really bad for a long time and it's hard for me to let that go. The thing is, it's probably the thing I should be letting go because what's done is done. <laughs> and all I can do is make an effort to change it in all of my actions going forward. So again, you're like stopping and using it as, as a leverage point. But if we don't think about it and maybe if we don't feel remorse about those things, could we continue to speak in anger to people and not even know or not be aware and actually be and actually be detriment, detrimentally affecting our relationships? And the answer is, I don't know, only we know for ourselves. What do you think, Joel? Well, hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll give you two, two, two different scenarios. I have a brother okay. that he's always. Oh, no, I'm kidding. Oh, wait, yeah, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead, start over. <laughs> <laughs> but he is always apologizing for things that were said. The reason being is because it would just come out, just yeah. come out, and then there's always regret, I'm sorry about all this kind of stuff. Me, I very rarely have to say that because it takes so much for me to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm never in a situation to where I have to go back because I've been wanting to say it for so long. Okay. And so it's always been there. So I, I very rarely have to do that, mm -hmm. but it, it does happen. And it happens mm -hmm. to a lot of people to where, you know, it, it's more of an emotional thing where it just comes out and it's like, well, you know what, maybe I should not. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in the best interest of all parties for me to to say that you know you bring up an interesting point about your brother because if and and i could use this for me too and this is actually how i became aware of some of my habits somebody somebody said to me quit apologizing you don't need to apologize for everything and it turned out i had not been thinking about what i was saying and i had been inadvertently aloof or distant or angry toward people in such a moment that I just got into the habit of apologizing and not really taking an action to, I didn't choose to change, I just chose to justify my behavior afterward with this apology. And then what happened is I was able to change that part, but I forgot to get rid of the apology that went with it. And now I was apologizing for the way I actually feel. I was apologizing for the way that things that I actually believe in. I was apologizing for doing things right. I was apologizing for using my voice and speaking up tactfully with courtesy. And that there are some habits that can come and go. And we really have to be diligent about acknowledging what those habits are and deciding when we change, if anything's lingering, do they, are there lingering secondary habits from that to be aware of in our lessons learned? And that's just for everyday relationship building more than anything else. And pre personal presentation. I mean, my relationships are affected when I apologize. People don't think I believe in myself. I mean, if we, that's actually one of the things you were, do you really believe in what you're saying? Of course I do. Then why are you apologizing for it? So I had to actually look and go, oh, the things I say, the things that I do in these habits that I'm not even aware of until somebody pointed this out to me are affecting how people look at me, how they see my ability, what they see my, what they see me being able to do for them and actually being there for them when they need it. Awesome.
everybody, he's just nodding. <laughs> Every, everybody, everybody's in agreement. Everybody's going, yep, yep. Preach. Preach. Yeah, Preach. That's right. Woo We're going to go ahead and, and conclude this. All the program notes will be at thevoiceofboldbusiness.com slash P16. You can also search the site for leverage lessons. We want to know what you think. We want to know your story. What was the lesson that you learned from an experience that you had and how are you, did you use it to change what was going on and use it as a launching pad? It is an important part of what being a leader is today because we need to recognize what we can just let go of and forgive of ourselves and what we can use to launch from to become the fullest, most beautiful, Selves that we can be and I'm going to end <clears throat> with a quote from John Wooden uh, One of the most famous coaches in history as I understand it. He says success is never final Failure is never fatal. It's the courage that counts And I'll make sure that that's in the program notes as well So remember our experiences provide us with leveraged lessons. See you next time Subscribe at thevoiceofboldbusiness.com and get more information, program notes, and past episodes. Bold leaders approach each situation and focus on action to achieve a higher level of leadership. Jessica Duell, your business advocate, is the host of the Voice of Bold Business Radio. Thank you for joining us.